여러분 안녕하십니까 어, 트랙 B의 세 번째 세션에 참여, 참여해주셔서 대단히 감사합니다 저는 이 세션을 맡아 진행하게 된 좌장 한국바스페 신호성입니다 아, 감사합니다 식후에 졸린 시간에 오셔서 좀 지루하실지 모르지만 제가 스피커 두 분한테 가능하면 말씀을 재미있게 달라고 부탁을 했습니다 유익한 인사이드를 얻어갈 수 있는 귀한 시간이 되길 바랍니다. 최근에 우리 기업에 있어서 큰 이슈 중에 하나가 핫 이슈가 인더스트리 4.0이고요. 그것이 등장하면서 빅데이터라든지 또는 디지털리제이션이라든지 이런 말들이 많이 나오고 있습니다. 물론 이것이 처음에는 숫자가 중요한 그 생산 분야에서 시작은 됐겠지만 그 다음에 메인터넌스 쪽 또는 서플라이 체인 쪽 그다음에 파이낸셜 섹터까지 그 영역이 확대돼 가고 있습니다. 최근에는 기업 그 분석을 하는 분 투자를 위한 기업 분석을 위해서 비재무적 지표를 찾는 데 있어서 인터넷에 나와 있는 기사를 서칭해서 그거를 자료화하는 그런 빅데이터 작업들도 이루어지는 것을 봤습니다. 그거에 비해서 HR은 가장 소프트하고 또 휴먼 터치가 있는 부분인데 그런 분야에서도 이제는 이런 기법들의 도입이 시작되고 있는 상황이라고 합니다. 또한 HR에 있어서 제너레이션 차이는 우리가 무시할 수 없는 중요한 요소가 되었습니다. 한 예로 X세대라고 일컬어지는 35대에서 쉬운쯤 되신 분들의 경우에는 먼저 잡을 구하고 나서 그 잡을 수행하기 위해서 자기가 살 곳을 정했는데 그 다음 세대인 Y세대는 즉 20대부터 한 35세까지는 먼저 자기가 살고 싶은 데를 정하고 거기에 있는 잡을 구한다고 합니다. 이렇게 많은 것이 급변하는 이런 환경에 있습니다. 이런 환경에서 과연 HR은 어떻게 준비해야 되고 어떻게 나아가야 하는지에 대해서 같이 오늘 이야기를 나누고자 합니다. 오늘 말씀해 주실 두 분의 스피커와 한 분의 토론자를 소개해 드리겠습니다. 제 왼쪽 처음부터 크런처의 설립자이신 덕 존커 대표님 그리고 SAP에서 인사 업무를 담당하시는 제니퍼 웅 부사장님 그리고 머서커리아의 박형철 대표님을 소개합니다. 큰 환영의 박수를 부탁드립니다. 맨 먼저 말씀을 해주실 더크 존커 대표님을 소개해 드리겠습니다. 암스테르담 대학에서 또 동대학원에서 계리학을 공부하시고 컨설팅 업체에 근무하신 다음에 2007년에 포커스 오렌지를 2014년에는 크런처를 설립하셔서 운영하고 계십니다. 오늘은 피플 어날리틱스에 대해서 말씀해 주시겠습니다. 그럼 존커 대표님을 큰 박수로 모시겠습니다. Thank you for having me here. I'm really honored to be speaking at this conference, and even more so that you chose to participate in our session. So thank you very much. I'm the founder of Cruncher, and Cruncher basically enables large corporations to start with workforce reporting and people analytics. And in the next 30 minutes, I would like to take you on a journey of what people analytics actually is. So this journey for me started 15 years ago. After I graduated from the University of Amsterdam in financial mathematics, I started working as a consultant in HR. And two things really struck me. The first one was the enormous amounts of data that companies keep, but that they don't use too much. And the second thing, is that even within HR, there is really big silos. So you have talent management here, you have total rewards here, you have recruiting here, learning and development, and typically, the bigger the organization gets, these companies within companies do not talk to each other. So what happens if talent does not talk to total rewards, then how can you make a policy to improve the pay of the people who are a bit more talented? 
or how do you measure the effectiveness of learning programs if you cannot connect to other metrics? So I thought about, I need to pursue this. I got really curious in this uh, topic. And um, for me, it was the start of a big data dream in HR, in human resources. So I went to New York with two suitcases and I founded there the company Focus Orange. We help companies in change using data. And change could be a restructuring. It could be um, when the products are changing, when the services are changing, when they enter new markets, when they come together. And there, I really wanted to develop some new techniques. So yesterday, we had a fantastic keynote speech of uh, Professor Ellen Langer, and she said very nicely, we should not use yesterday's solutions to solve today's problems. And that's exactly what I'm pushing myself towards soon. So let's take a look at what these problems are. We talked a lot about company agility. Basically, that companies will only survive if they're really flexible. Yesterday, another great session by uh, Daniel Seifman. He said, you cannot really predict the future. And it got me thinking last night, and I was like, you're right. And therefore, the core capabilities of companies need to be that they're super flexible, that they can change, just like the skier on a downhill slope. Brian Cohen yesterday also said that change has become part of our life, especially for the younger generation. So change is a constant factor. So how can companies accommodate to this change, how they can become really flexible. This is something that I heard this morning very nicely spoken by uh, McKinsey. And they said, you know, it's a human capital. For already a couple of years, the human capital was ranked number one by CEOs on what the most important influencer is. But if you think about human capital, I always like to think about it as a big container ship. Why? These container ships, they're big, right? 19,000 containers nowadays. When they need to be in the harbor, they, the captain needs to shut down the engines hours before they even approach the harbor. Otherwise, they have too much speed. Human capital is exactly like this. You cannot just overnight change the people that you have in your company. It takes a long time. Changing culture may even take years. And now, if I look at the captain on the ship, he knows everything. You know, he uses his gut feel, which is still very important, his eyes, his binoculars. But he also has a big dashboard of monitors showing the direction of your ship, showing the speed, how much gasoline you still have in your tank. And he needs that to drive the ship efficiently from one harbor to the other harbor. Another famous quote that I that heard this morning at McKinsey was, it's not the companies who provide a competitive advantage, it's really your people. So think about the ship. And then, if I then turn to the HR director, how much does the HR director know about their ship, about their human capital? It's very limited. I talk to a lot of uh, bigger companies in the US, in Europe, and they all talk about predictive analytics, and I will talk a bit later about that. But when I return the question, I say, so how many people do you employ currently? It takes weeks to get 12 different answers. So even the basics, it's very difficult to grasp. And I will talk a bit about uh, why that is. But imagine that you don't even have a headcount, so how many people you have. How can you say things about workforce aging impact? Or how can you support your board of management with changing your ship to a new destination? So this is all that people analytics is about. And there's many definitions. But what you need to take away from this is that people analytics is using digital methods to get a really deep understanding of how people, organization, and business interact. And if you solve that question, then you can be the best HR business partner to your CEO and to the board of management. Because then there is a new direction with this flexibility of this organization. And then the HR director can say, okay, but this has impact for the organization structure. We need to change these skills. We need to redeploy these people. And therefore, our employee value proposition needs to change like that. Now, digital methods, it's a bit of a vague concept, but it has everything. It has 
elements from mathematical statistics to artificial intelligence, which we also heard yesterday, but also visualization methods. Because sometimes visualization can be a beautiful way to make complex data sets more intuitively available, and I will show you. Now, people analytics is uh, hitting the market, and that means that companies start to see that they can create a competitive advantage by understanding how these dynamics work. So companies who can quickly reduce cost or quickly reinvest cost into other parts of the company, redeploy people, they'll come out as winners after this crisis. What you see here is a picture. Um, I took it last year, and it was at the HR Tech in Las Vegas. And the HR Tech is a big conference, a big exhibition. Last year, there were more than 4,000 professionals from the US, from Asia, trying to look for new methods on how to measure employee engagement, the effectiveness of recruiting, and to enter in people analytics. And to just give you a glimpse of how big this was, just to move from one corner of the exhibition to the other corner of the exhibition took 15 minutes to walk. It's huge. Three weeks ago, I was in Chicago, exactly the same conference. And you can see that there is more and more interest. Two weeks ago, I delivered a keynote speech in Paris, also on people analytics. It's becoming very important. My expectation is that it's on the top three of the CEO agenda next year. And that's needed because it's not just a gimmick, it's not just a nice to have. No, it's the answer for HR professionals to deliver on the expectations that are quickly rising. So what you see on the screen in the middle is the head of HR, or let's call it the human resources function within companies. And there's all stakeholders around it that have expectations. So when I was still working as an employee for a boss, I had the expectations and the hope that this company would do something for me. I dedicate a couple of years of my life with tremendous overtime. So what I want is that this company develops me. It gives me career path. That if I look back after four years, that I say it was a nice time, I had nice colleagues, and I really learned something that I can take on to a next job. But we also have the board of management that says, dear HR professional, you spend about 70% of what the entire company spends every year. So 70%, depending a bit on the branch, but imagine you have a consulting firm. Then most of the money that you spend is on people. Salaries, education, learning and development, retirement. So how can you not use some kind of analytics to make sure that you invest that money in the right way? Now, I talk to so many companies and they all get it but they really struggle on how to implement people analytics. The first observation is that it is really unclear who actually owns the people agenda. So who feels ultimately really responsible for people and for the people strategy? All the CEOs will say, oh, human capital is the most important thing that, uh, that we have. But do they really take ownership? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And then you have the HR director that cannot really live with this ambiguity of who really sets this people's strategy. And what they do, they return in process mode. Ooh, I just need to make sure that at the end of the month, everybody is paid and that I just register all the recruits. Well, that is to me HR administration. It's very important, but it's not what we talk about. Second thing is that companies struggle with data. We heard it this morning in the panel discussion in this very much room. The bigger the company, the more countries they operate, the more business units they have, and typically every country has their own HR system. And all these systems are not connected to each other. Different companies, different uh, countries within a company have different definitions. So if you want to rate performance, maybe in uh, the Netherlands they will use a 10-point scale, and in the US they would have low, medium, high. How do you compare these elements? It's also a question on once you have these insights, how to act upon these insights. So be your internal HR consultant. That is often lacking. Not to talk about the natural reflex that many companies don't have. They say, well, we can solve this data quality issue. We just implement one system in the whole world. That's what many companies did two, three years ago. 
But then they realized that, you know, implementing such a system is a big effort. It takes years. And once you have implemented this system, it does not live up to expectations. Why? Because these typical HR systems are meant to create processes, and to facilitate processes, not to do things with data. That's a totally different architecture. That is completely different from the question that you're trying to solve. Last but not least, with all these rising expectations and the crisis, HR departments have slimmed down. So if there were budget cuts, it was on HR, it was on IT, it was on finance, because they are not generating money, right? So doing more with less people. Now, it is not so easy to overcome, but there is a strategy. And let's compare it to one of the best restaurants in Europe. It's in Girona in Spain, and they have three Michelin stars. And how do you think they got to three Michelin stars? It was not just because they had the best ingredients, or because they had the best cooks, or because they had the best kitchen gear, or they knew exactly what the customers want. No, it was a combination. So by just implementing a huge HR system, it does not help, because you still need skills on how to work with data. You still need to know what kind of questions to ask the data. So the most important thing here is to build up your capability in a very harmonized way. Pace is very important. And then, as I also heard this morning, you need to fit people analytics inside your business framework. Because, let's be honest, we don't do people analytics just for the sake of doing people analytics. I mean, believe me, it's really cool. But you do it to support your business. So there's many frameworks again. I like to talk about this framework, um, which starts always with your business strategy and with your forecast. So I believe that the CHRO, the Chief HR Officer, or the talent leader, should be able to translate business strategy into the people requirements. What does it actually mean? So let's take an example of a bank. Banks are transitioning from an offline to an online model. I see many local offices of banks disappearing because people do banking online nowadays. So what does that mean for the capabilities of the workforce? Well, it means that you need more people with, for example, cybersecurity backgrounds or people that can work with data in order to analyze all these transactions, different profiles. So what I want is that HR is able to translate the business strategy into people requirements. Not only people requirements, but also organization requirements. So what kind of culture do we need in order to deliver on this business strategy? How is our organization designed? Is it very layered, so you have a lot of control, safety? Or do we need an innovative model where we have a flat organization, or maybe not even an organization, but we have tribes, as they call it, groups that work together. Let's look at the right side. What kind of workforce capabilities do we need? This is always a question on how many people, what kind of people, what kind of skills do we need, and how many do we have? And the delta, the difference between this, will result in your sourcing strategies on how to close in on these gaps. So that could be very simple, like, we need to hire more people in country XYZ with these skills. And then we'll get to, yeah, um, to the subsequent um, strategies, which is, okay, so now that I know what kind of people, how many people I need to attract in order to deliver on this business strategy, let's now build an employee value proposition, so an employer brand or a total rewards package to attract those people that I need in the future. And see now how here these silos are coming together. But also, how do we create a talent pipeline to develop leaders that can deliver on those expectations of the future? So in these two elements, in total rewards and in succession planning, I'm gonna show you two very concrete examples of how people analytics can help you. So the first is succession planning. And maybe a little hand rise. How many of you are actually participating in succession planning or your company? So we see just a few. So what succession planning really is, let me take myself as an example. I lead the data science and technology team of my company. When I make a next move, I wanna make sure that I've already assigned somebody to become my successor, which means that I um, train this person 
And probably I'm not taking one, but I take two or three people that I have in mind, and I make it into a plan. So succession planning is many times done from a risk mitigation perspective, just to make sure that if somebody leaves a critical position, that there is other candidates who are ready to, to jump into that position. But it's also done from a talent development perspective. And later, I will show you how important that is. So it also means career paths. You can go to your supervisor and say, hey, you know, I've been doing this work for three years already. What are the plans that you have in mind? So succession planning always from risk mitigation to people development. So how does it work in practice? Locations are creating their plans for their local leaders. They communicate it to the region, and they talk a lot about, oh, this is, well, this is a good person, but ooh, are you sure you want to put that person in that position? So it takes a lot of time, and this um, is added up to business unit level and to global level, so that you have a beautiful pipeline, basically a grand plan of what is going to happen. But then, this process takes a lot of time, a lot of senior management involvement, and that's why it only happens once a year. So what do you think what happens after half a year when somebody moves out of a critical position? They take the plan and they're like, what? Did we ever thought that this person would be a successor there? Hmm, not really. And the other person, oh, this person already left the company. So plans get outdated very quickly. And then the last issue that always happens is that everybody looks at the same top potential as their successor. So imagine that you all need a successor for people analytics. Then maybe you all say, well, Dirk can maybe do that role. But if you all line me up for your position, then it's a very weak network. So just think about it. We have a person in a position at a certain time frame. John can become director of finance in two years, and I'm going to develop him. So what we do is we like to visualize these networks because visualization helps you to visualize 5,000 lines of Excel. And this is how it looks. This is what we build. Every dot is a person in a position. And if you, if you look really carefully, you see little arrows. Position, position, and there's an arrow. So this person can take this role. Now, I appreciate it's a bit of a gimmick, but right away, you see very weird things going on. In the top, you'll see that a lot of points are pointing to the same person. These are these top potentials that are so wanted in an organization. What you also see in the middle is that everybody is each other's successor. Well, then you mitigate the risk, but there is no clear development path. So visualization can be a digital method to really start to understand the data and show this to an HR professional with five minutes training, and this person can talk a lot. Second thing that we do is we like to, so, okay. We like to um, look at this talent pool to see who is ready for a next move. Because maybe those are the people that I want to focus on. So what you see here is a talent risk monitor. Every dot is again an identified talent by the company. And the question that we're trying to solve here is, you spend so much extra energy in these people. You put them on MBAs, you put them on short-term assignments, you spend a lot of money, they, they get FaceTime with, with your very senior directors. So make sure that you keep developing these people. You can be earmarked as a top potential, but if you are not developed for four years, you might leave the company. So on the horizontal, uh, sorry, vertical axis, you see risk of loss. What we do there is we track patterns in the data, where we try to guess a probability of how likely it is that people are leaving the company. Now, the impact of leaving a company is different for, for example, a CEO or a student who just came into the company. So therefore, you always need to look at the impact of loss. What is the impact to the company if this person is leaving? And then obviously you want to focus first on those people in the top right with the highest risk of leaving and the highest impact of leaving. And then you connect that again to your succession plans. Do we have plans? 
if these people are leaving, do we have successors lined up? And why are these people likely to leave? Are they on any succession plans? Yesterday there was another um, conversation and it was about developing global citizens. I think it was your very first um, minister, uh, minister of education who said, in this globalization, globalization, in this world, we need to develop global citizens. Well, also here, succession planning can really help. I have a good friend in New York. His name is Ronald. And um, if I'm his successor, at some moment, there is a person flow from the Netherlands to the United States, or from Amsterdam, where I currently live, to New York. Well, try to visualize this data. What you see here on the left-hand side is where the leaders are currently residing. I'm in Amsterdam, so I'm in the Netherlands. But the company has plans to develop me to a position in the United States. So this basically is an indicator for global mobility. Now, why is global mobility very important? We just had a very nice lunch on with uh, Kipa, with some very talented students. And uh, they asked me, like, how do you become a good entrepreneur? And one thing that I really believe in is that you need to travel the world to get to know different types of cultures. Because that's at the end the people that you will be working with. There is a company in the Netherlands quite famous and it did a lot of research on what makes leaders great leaders. And these were all people that have worked in multiple locations, in multiple business units, so they get to know the product, and in multiple functional areas. So you start in HR, maybe you then move to finance, and then you get a role in business. If that is your strategy, this is the way to visualize it. And even on city level, you can make really nice pictures. So this is again connecting your business strategy with a process called succession planning. Now this does not solve the whole idea of plans being outdated quickly. And we are currently highly experimental phase of a new module where we say, why don't we train a system that starts to understand what makes a person a good fit for a position. So it's basically what I call a neural network. We have again here a position, here a, here a person, and what are the characteristics of this position? What are the characteristics of this uh, person? And can the computer get, um, get patterns there? And we use all of these succession plans that are calibrated on regional level, on global level, on business unit level, to train the system. The result is that now we have talent on demand. So we don't need to do any more these extensive succession planning rounds, which really takes months. But we just say to the computer, here there is a person leaving the position. Go find in the entire database, according to the logic, where we can find potential successors. This also addresses a very cool problem, which is that most of the times the most vocal people, the people that run hard, the people that are most visible, are always up for you know, promotions. But this really looks at data. It can also provide career path opportunities for employees. I always talk about you know, external experiences. Maybe go to another country go to another business unit, but is that actually what everybody wants? I was getting pretty fed up with all the articles on millennials on LinkedIn. I don't know how you feel about it, but I felt that this group was heavily generalized. All the millennials want to decide where they work, when they work, how they work. Well, I think it is true for a part of the millennials, but not for everybody. So what did we do? We, together with Deloitte, consulting firm, we did extensive scientific research on millennials. And we try to ask the question, what are the most important factors for millennials to choose for a company? And it could be salary, it could be a bonus, it could be external um, you know, experiences, it could be a great place to work. But for everybody, it's probably a bit different. So what I also 
didn't want to do is go out to SurveyMonkey or to, to any survey tool to ask, how do you rate salary? Well, of course, the highest of the highest. How do you rate career opportunities? The highest of the highest. How much do you create culture? Well, very important. No, what we did was we created this survey where you drag and drop balls into a diamond shape. And these balls on the left-hand side are a combination of all the things that might be more or least important for you to choose for a company. And it's a mix of monetary and non-monetary elements. And the question is very simple, just drag and drop. And the more populated this diamond gets, the more difficult it is for participants to answer these questions. What's the outcome? This is the outcome of the average millennial. Almost a thousand uh, millennials in this subset. Number one, challenging work. Number two, career opportunities. Now remember how important succession planning is. Number three, salary. In the bottom three, you'll th see things like variable pay. So this tells me that the average millennial does not run for a higher bonus. They will run for better education, for better coaching and support. This is something also we heard this morning at NASA, which they also experienced. And now because we understand the um, uh, characteristics of these people, we can just say, okay, so out of our workforce planning, again, this, this bank example, we need more people with computer science, with engineering background. So click, click, how does it change the preferences of people? So now suddenly we can create an employer brand tied to those people that you need in the future, getting rid of inefficiencies. Let's go a step deeper. And now we enter the artificial intelligence. So we say, you know, we can make so many different combinations. So as you can see here, you can say, um, you can filter by gender, by where they work, how they work, etc. But too many combinations. So computer, create me one employer package that satisfies most people. Well, then this is what you get. So again, challenging work, career opportunities, salaries. And if you then calculate the average satisfaction, it is 69.7%. And that is not too high. So this tells me that we don't have a group where everybody has the same preferences. So now let's use some marketing science to say, computer, create maybe three different packages for me. And let's see how this satisfaction rate increases from 69.7% to close to 80%. So what I'm presenting you here is the mathematical proof that the millennial does not exist. Also millennials are different. So let's take a look at how different. Career opportunities is in group one, number four. There is a group of millennials that say, well, for me it's really the most important in combination with salary. And there is a group that says, well, just make sure that you challenge me at work, give me great career opportunities, give me education, give me a great place to work, give me coaching and support, innovation, international work, and then salary. So salary for group three is by far not the most important part. These are people that think like, invest in enablers, and that salary will come at the end. Give me a few years, just help me to develop. What about job security? I thought it was not so important because the economy is picking up. So employers don't care about job security anymore in communication to millennials. Well, there is a group, which is group number two, which find job security very, very important. So getting almost to the last slide, people analytics is making sure that you understand this business strategy that you can break it down in what kind of organization do we need and what kind of workforce do we need. And then please make sure that your total rewards department, who is constructing pension plans, who is constructing bonus schemes, etc., understand what people want and that you optimize for those people that you need in the future. Last slide. If you want, if you're now here and you think like, well, this sounds really amazing and I need to do something with it, you can do it yourself already with the tools that you currently have. You don't need to go out to external vendors. But what I will give you as an advice is to take a dual strategy. And this means make sure you get your house in order when it comes to HR data. 
So make sure that very simple questions, such as how many people do we have? What is our diversity and inclusion number? How many layers in the organization do we have? What is the turnover of computer scientists in our Singapore business? That you can answer those questions like this. And then on the second track, this is where you hide a bit in the organization. This is where you say, let's take some very interesting questions. For example, do we pay males and females equal in, uh, in the same jobs, for example? You keep it very low and you start experimenting. You will fail, you will do it again, you continue to experiment. And every time that you have something that is business relevant, you say, hey, look what we did. We did a very cool research. And it is possible because we have our house in order. Thanks very much. SAP Korea의 인사 부문을 담당하고 계신 제니퍼 응 부사장입니다. 동시에 SAP 아시아 퍼시픽 재팬의 글로벌 커스터머 오퍼레이션을 맡고 계십니다. 원래는 하이로 페르난데스 수석 부사장님이 오시게 되었었는데 몸이 편찮으셔서 대신 제니퍼 응 부사장님께서 참석해 주셨습니다. 제니퍼 응 부사장님은 싱가포르 국립대학에서 경영학을 전공하시고 유니버시티 오브 뉴저지에서 HR 석사 학위를 받으셨습니다. 싱가포르 정부에서도 근무하신 적이 있고 SAP 전에 다양한 회사에서 HR 부문의 책임자로 일하셨습니다. 그럼 큰 박수로 제니퍼 응 부사장님을 모시겠습니다. Okay, this podium is a bit too tall for short people like me, so I hope you can see me. Um, good afternoon, everyone. A pleasure to be here. But firstly, let me apologize for Hyro, uh, my colleague who has uh, taken ill unexpectedly this week. So I'm here to stand in for him. So thank you for the opportunity for me to share with you what digital economy means to us in terms of people strategy and what can we do, what do we need to do to disrupt instead of being disrupt. So um, I'm going to share with you some data that SAP did with uh, ex, uh, Oxford Economics on Leadership 2020 and Workforce 2020, and then look at what it means to us as HR professionals and as leaders, and how can we uh, ride the wave of digital economy and be successful as a business and as a profession. So that's... Uh, where's, do I move here? So, oh, do I click? Sorry. Ah, so, thank you very much. Uh, I think I need to go backwards. Sorry for that. So, the first question to us here as leaders and as uh, people professionals is, does your people strategy look to the future or just defend the presence? Let me share some data. I think if you look back, um, research shows that 52% of the Fortune 500 companies in two, year 2000 is no longer around. So, for, and 40% of the 500 S&P companies will not exist if they do not keep up with the digital economy and do something about it. So in early 2016, so what SAP did is we worked with Oxford Economics to look into what we call a, a research called leadership 2020 to look at what does it mean for us as leaders. Now, this is a follow-up research from what we did in 2014, which we call Workforce 2020, which uh, look at what does it mean to us in, in 2020 in terms of the composition of workforce. What they found out is this, as you can see from the oops, is it moving? system, 67% of the management says that they are equipped to facilitate transformation, but for Korea, only 40%. So you're behind the global peers in terms of get ready. Now, 49% of the global executives say the leadership recognized the importance of diversity and taken steps to develop it. But in Korea, only 12% of your executives say they are ready. So what that diversity could be the biggest stumbling block for us in Korea um, to be successful in this uh, digital era. So really, the question to us is how are we going to structure our people strategy 
so that we look to the future and not just defend the present and, and hope that we are successful. Now, as Doug say, we are in a world of change, right? We are in the shifting demographics. There are now five generations around us, in our, probably in our home, also in the workforce, basically, and every one of us have our characteristics. I'm, I must confess, I'm Generation X. To me, certain things are important to me, but the Dupont Millennials is not. So understanding what is important, what are the motivators or the differentiator is important to us to structure our people's strategy so that we retain these talents and make sure that we give them a rewarding and encouraging career with us. So that's important to understand that change, what it means to you in terms of your workforce. Now, millennia will form 75% of the global workforce in 2025. And for us in Asia, uh, Asia Pacific uh, Japan, 65% of our workforce will be millennia by 2020. So that, that group of talents that we are all fighting to have, we really need to understand how do we bring them into our organization and develop them. Now, the second thing is technological advancement. I've been in the workforce for a long time. I won't tell you how long, because you can calculate my age, but the technology the last one, two, three years is amazing, right? It's so exponential in how it changed. Sometimes I, I used to be called, a, they call me a technology gadget woman, right? I'm actually the first in my team, my colleagues and my peers to know what technology is all about, etc. I must confess, even now, I feel I'm, I'm losing that, that age in terms of catching up with technology. So that's something that we all need to recognize. Now, you know that uh, maybe you heard, even in Singapore, we have launched a first ever robot service, taxi services, just to pilot it in Singapore. Kim I, I wouldn't imagine that years ago, right? And Uber has also, of course, piloted in Pittsburgh, the self-driving car. So I think we see this in movies, probably like, uh, who is the one that Michael J. Fox added in, Back to the Future? Things then seem so impossible. Virtual reality, he was looking at this thing and he can see games and all, but now it's a reality. So these are things that we, we have to face and really catch up in order to really survive in this uh, world. And many more will come and many more will disrupt the business, the economy, etc. So it's for us who really, really constantly have the growing and learning mindset as leaders and as a HR professionals, also as employee, to catch up with what's going on in order to really understand. Now, of course, uh, there's these new work models. You may have heard about this work gig economy and on-demand economy. A lot of uh, people are now looking for a work uh, model that fits their, their lifestyle, flexible, autonomy, some of them even have, you know, part-time because they want it. So there's an example where a sales GM gave up uh, in a bank in Singapore, gave up her job so that it can be a grab car driver. Why? She's happy with that flexibility. She has her life back so she can choose what she wants to do. And a lot of millennials are in that category, by the way. They want a work that is meaningful to them, etc. So we need to really understand what are the new work models that probably will work to retain and, uh, our employees, etc. Of course, uh, I think we all know this rising level of transparency. I always tell my nephew, please don't share your life in your Facebook. If you share your life, don't share my life. Because everything is so transparent to them now, isn't it? The social media, the internet of things. So uh, for some of us who are in the older generation, we think, okay, uh, compensation is confidential. If you share it, you can be disciplined. Hey, now everything is in in social media, so the level of transparency is so high right now, but we just have to see how we deal with it, right? People are so hyper-connected, and actually they can share everything about their life, as I say. Now, what does it mean to us then? What does it mean to us in that scenario, the future of work? We have a more fluid workforce. Nearly 45% of the workforce will be contingent workers by the end of 2017. For us, uh, research shows that right now, 35% of the workforce in 2015 are contingent workers. So what does it mean to us? This will grow. This is a reality. People will not want to have their traditional permanent job. A lot of people will want to go for flexible arrangement where I join you, I do a project, I lead a team, and then, hey, I move on maybe in your other part of your organization or to another organization. So that's the reality, and that's going to be a force to look at, right? The composition of workforce will change. And second thing is, from a company's perspective, right? We have to start learning to source from other uh, sources rather than permanent employee. And for us, really getting talent in this really competitive world, uh, you really have to think about how do you attract all types of uh, workers 
to make sure that we actually hire to their, uh, what they want to do, right? So like I said, now a lot of them uh, will join you uh, to lead your, your project team. So we have uh, a uh, sur survey by Arden Partners that uh, we look at. 95% of organizations says that now contingent workers are critical not just for the day-to-day -day operations, but to their overall enterprise success and growth. So that's not something that we, we, we close our eyes and make sure that, you know, just say, okay, permanent employees is who we look at uh, because we will lose a great chunk of talent pool that we will miss. So what does it show? That for us, really, as HR, really look at our workforce planning, really look at our, what our, how do we composite our workforce to ride this wave of changes. Now in SB, for example, uh, we recognize that there's a lot of ladies, especially in Korea, who gave up their job when they have young families, right? Uh, it's family pressure, peer pressure, whatever. They are great talents and they went and looked after their kids for a few years. So what we have started a, a project called Back to Work, where these this great talents who left the workforce, we gave them a, a few months job with us, let them feel what technology is all about now what workforce is all about now, let them feel comfortable with the change environment and then they feel confident to venture out to take back full-time job. So these are some of the things that we in SAP are trying to be creative as well to support uh, this growing change. Now from the employee's perspective, right? So like I said, many people are going on this on-demand economy looking for jobs that fit their needs, fit their lifestyle, etc. So we need to look at how to create that environment where they feel that they have autonomy, they have flexibility, and yet they achieve uh, what they need to. Now furthermore, I guess with the uh, tremendous transparency that we have, you know the jobs out there. Everyone can see what's out there. So the labor movement will be even be more. We actually see a more churn in the employment going forward than, than not. So uh, a survey shows that millennials, they will change jobs every two years. What they do is they join an organization achieve what their career aspirations are after one, two years. Once they achieve that, they move on to somewhere else who may give them more, uh, to build up their resume and give them more experience. So this is something to look at. So I guess uh, for us in Korea, we really, really need to look at how to look at our workforce planning and how to incorporate all these changes uh, and, and make sure we don't lose tap of those talents that's available out there. Now, this is where we look at what we call the end of a traditional career. Some of us stay in a job, get a job, um, oftentimes stay there and think that I will grow, I will learn, and I will grow with the organization. And just be in my particular field of specialization, so I'm an expert. Right now, the world is changing. Doing just one thing is over. A lot of large organizations are looking at what they call the T professionals. These are the ones who may have their depth of their experience, but they also have the breadth where they look at how to work with fellow colleagues, how to collaborate with fellow colleagues, to gain from their areas of expertise and incorporate in their work, in, incorporate in their decision making. So actually, right now, even for SAP, we are saying that for future leaders, they are, if they are only doing one job, they are not gonna move very far with us. We are looking at leaders who actually have broader experience from sales. You move into maybe even finance, operations, or HR, and then or from Asia Pacific, you, you move somewhere else, maybe to America or or somewhere outside your country of comfort and gain the international exposure, then you are the future leaders who knows how to work with a global diverse workforce. A lot of the leaders right now are saying that they, they do not have the expertise, right? So we are looking at that. So basically, T professional vertical is where they are specialized in their area. Horizontal is where they learn how to collaborate with others and incorporate those learnings into their work. Even for us in HR, I was at one conference, I was sharing with the uh, workers who were attending the conference. Really sometimes move out of your comfort zone. We may be, let's say for me, I'm in HR. What's stopping me to go into business operations? Understand how the business works. After one, two years, then move back into the HR and be even a more value-added uh, HR professional because I now understand the business process a bit more. Even in HR, I may be in recruitment now. What stops me to take up the HR business partner role for one, two years, understand what the perspective is and move back? into where I am I'm more passionate about. So my encouragement is to everyone is, do not think that your career progression is always upwards. It is a possibility to be lateral first, and then you move upwards faster. So think about that, even for us as leader and HR professional. Provide that environment for employees to encourage them 
to actually diverse their perspectives, to gain more experience than where they're comfortable in. Now, the other one is, you can see this slash. The other one is called slash workers. That's the, the other category. These are the workers who actually daytime, they do whatever they, are, they, they like, or they maybe earn a living, but nighttime, they do what they're passionate is. Like, um, there's, millennials are very fond of this. In Singapore, I see a common trend now. They are professionals in the day, and guess what they do in their free time? I think you can guess. They are Uber drivers. So this is where they drive around, etc. Now, you know, you may heard that Google has even allowed the engineers to work on things they're passionate about, not just a day job and give them the KPIs. So these are the ones who come up with creative ideas and the company can be innovative. So for us as an organization, really think about what more options can we give to employees to see what their passions are beyond the normal job, normal job they have. What are the areas are their passion that we can create the environment that encourage them to do two things at one time. I think you all know it's amazing what the millennials are. Some of us feel, uh, may feel that, hey, how can they focus when music is on? But this, this millennial group, they really can multitask. Right? So think about that and see how we can uh, build on building the, uh, their career. Now, these this slides may, may create some reaction employee rules. Now, I think you know that the transparency that I talked about earlier is so high right now. They, they have such interconnectivity to each other, to the world, that they actually can see what's going on. So for them, hey, I can choose any company I want because it's out there. I can talk to my friends around the world, not just within a company. I can actually have mobile. Some of us who are probably in the early years talent, I call, may not be comfortable to move out of our country, et cetera. Hey, but the new generations, they strive on this excitement. They have no issues moving around out of their, their, their areas of geography to just really get the exposure because they are exposed to the world. They have friends in the world, whether it's through Facebook or whatever. So employee rules in the future because they have the choices, they can select, right? So what does, like I said, the millennia will form the majority of the workforce in 2020 and 2025. So they will change the culture at work. So what does it mean? What actually matters to them? So first thing is meaningful work. The survey that we did uh, with uh, Oxford Research is they want meaningful work. They want to feel that they can make a difference to the world. So they expect the company to give them things they can feel, can see, and they can share with their friends around the world that their work actually have benefit and in whatever way to, to make the world run simple or to make the world run better. I think Dirk also mentioned meaningful work is actually more and more important to the newer generations. Yeah? So even in SAP, for example, we actually, my regional president launched this project, One Billion Lives, how we can impact one billion lives. It's not even about work, but give the opportunity for employees to give back. So we have projects in Japan, India, et cetera, where uh, the employees put us at their own free time to research on how can we use our software to predict seismic activities, to predict earthquake in Japan. We are also using our s hana software. How do we help cancer research? so that you know, uh, it can be treated quicker and faster. So these are the things that the millennials are so passionate about it, and they really jump in and say, put up their hands and say, I want to make a difference to the world. So these are some of the things to look at. Now, simplification. I think when I started work uh, years ago, I don't think I even have a laptop, etc. So right now, to me, hey, the system I have in the company is already very good. So why are you not happy with it? But to the millennials, I'm born with a phone in my hand. I'm born with apps that one click, I can do everything. So to them, simplification is a way of life. Your complex HR processes that we are having, hey, they won't take it. It's like, why? Why are you so complex? I want it more simple. So simplicity to them is really important. Now, of course, there's this feedback that we talk about. Once a year in the past was enough, right? The traditionalist, the generation X and Y, it's enough. Once a year, you tell me how I'm doing, tell, give me my salary, give me my bonus, hey, I'm happy as long as I'm not underperforming category. But for this group of millennials, they want continuous feedback. It's not even just once a month, regular. Tell me how I'm doing, what I'm doing well, what I'm not doing well, so I can actually improve myself. So continuous feedback is a trend that they, I have seen it, I've heard it directly from the millennials. And the last one is, not last but not least, but show the love. I have one who, in fact, a group of them that I interacted with told me, be patient with me. I think some of us older generation, we learn through the hard way. We learn through our hard work. We learn through our own reading, etc. So we expect the same from the younger generations. 
They are saying like, I will get there, be patient with me, give me feedback, mentor me, I will get there, but be patient. You guide me, coach me. So this is what they want to be feel as a human. So they want to be understood. They want to feel the care from you and from me as, as their leaders. So this is the difference between uh, you know, the millennials and us. Now, that's why SAP has launched into um, what we call SAP Top, where we are going to remove performance rating. We piloted this year, all solely in the spirit of how do we encourage the continuous feedback about career, about developmental going forward. It's no longer about past performance. That is good to know, but how do we help people to develop further in their career and in their skills, etc., and have the continuous feedback, not just once uh, a blue moon, right, regularly. So uh, this, I hope, will help to the millennials. Now, uh, I think one slide. Okay, now we have been talking about technology, the impact of machines, and thanks to Dirk who mentioned AI, so I don't have to do that. <laughs> Basically, now I think there's a survey by Oxford University that's pretty well known. 47% of jobs will disappear in the next 20 years due to technology, robots, AI, machine learning will open up new ways of working smarter and better. So I think it's not that jobs will be gone, but they will be changing. So basically, so we are need to look at how do we, with this freedom that we have given to ourselves, we don't have to do the mundane job, we have time, how do we create the environment that employees can do more interesting things, more things that they are passionate about that add values to our business. Now I think one example is uh, shared by this gentleman, Josh, but since in 1980s, I think you will recall the ATMs was first invented and everyone is worried that the tellers were gone away. But the end result is, hey, more than a, what, 100 million, 1 million ATMs around the world and more jobs were created for tellers, etc. So technology is not a, here to take away jobs. Actually, they're just creating different jobs. So there's something to think about. How do we grow transformation uh, between man and machine? Now, of course, therein lies what we English call the dichotomy of digitalization. Right? On one hand, it will replace jobs, it may create silos and make people and organization uncomfortable using technology, but if taken the right way, it gives us an unforeseen opportunity, really never before do we have this, to make an impact using technology, get insights like the people analytics that Doug share, make things fundamentally the mindset needs to change. How do we use data to help us to make decisions faster, quicker and in a simpler manner? We just need to embrace it to see how to make it a better life for us in that sense and not take it as a fear that is taking away our job. It's embracing it and make the best use of it. Now, what does this mean to us way forward for employees? As technology changes so fast, companies are facing the common thing. How do we get the right talents? with the right skills, because technology is changing so fast. What's relevant today may not be relevant in, in the next one to two years. So basically, companies are looking at finding people with what we call the chameleon workers, people who are versatile, who are nimble, who embraces changes, who are always willing to learn new things, and who's able to jump from assignment to assignment. It's not those who fix that I'm, I'm good in this way, I'm going to stay this way for the rest of my career. So no, we need to change. We need to be really what we call chameleon workers. Really see what's out there, learn as much as we can, have a growing mindset. Not a fixed mindset, but a growing mindset to absorb the, what, what's the newest technology out there and adjust ourselves so that we can be nimble and help the company and ourselves to be successful. Now, uh, forward. Okay, for organizations, I think I missed one. Okay, for leaders, the way forward. What does it mean for us in this new thing? Embrace digital technologies. Execute a company-wide digital vision. That is the way of world now. Embed technology in all aspects of your organization and use technology to help you to build your business strategy and people's strategy in particular. These are the things that will help you to be nimble, help you to be fast, and give you data facts-based decision. Streamline your decision making. Make data-driven decisions in real time. Right now, we all have our mobile, we have our iPad or your Samsung Note, etc. So how do we have all this data online immediately that we can make uh, decisions using facts? So decision making across the organization, not just at the top, 
see how you can make decisions lower down in small groups, enable them, empower them so that they actually can make decisions as well and not let the top level be the stumbling block. Flatten the organization. I think uh, the biggest challenge I think organizations have in the past is really one reporting to one, reporting to one because of career. We want to give that people management career aspiration for people who want to be manager. So we built many layers. Can you imagine the cost to the organizations? It is a high cost when you build layer upon layer. So flatten the organization, that will also reduce your complexity. That will also remove your bureaucracy in the organization. Offer the latest technology to the, all the employees. Like I said, right now technology is so advanced, everyone is used to it. Provide the environment where they come in and say, hey, you are a hip company to work for, you have the latest technology, and it's gonna help me to work better and faster. And of course, build the digital workforce and improve the digital proficiency among managers and employees. So emphasize transform transformation readiness and really how to use the technology in a strategic manner. So this is for leaders really to think about how can you build that so that you can write the wave of digitalization and be successful going forward. Now for organizations, of course, as I mentioned, rethink your organization structure. Flatten it, empower it. Uh, in SAP, for example, we have thought about, we have in the past a lot of hierarchies like I've mentioned right now. One of the key words that we have is micro teams. We have a policy in the companies. There's no micro teams less than seven so that there is really better management spend, et cetera, and not reduce the layer of complexity and bureaucracy. Offer flexible career options, as I mentioned earlier. Um, right, flexible work arrangement is a key thing now around the world. Even the Singapore government is getting MNCs together with them and exploring how to implement that. So something to think about, to offer that to your employees so that they can have uh, that flexibility to deal with their lifestyle needs, right? You have young mothers who probably need to work a different time. They may have to come to work maybe at 10, but I will can stay till eight. Why not? Give them the option. Do you retain great talents? And you have provided them the need they have to, to manage their lifestyle. Childcare subsidies, childcare centers, all these things will help you to retain your bright young talents who actually have a young family. So think about that, flexible career options. We also thought about sharing of jobs. If someone cannot work in the afternoon, can only work in the morning, hey, why not have job share? So think about all this when uh, these are the options you can think about. Now, we used to talk about employee engagement is key. Right now, employee engagement is not enough. It's employee advocacy. These are the employees who will go around telling her friends, using the Facebook, using the social media, how great you are, how happy they are working for you, etc. These are going to be your ambassadors. So it's not just that they are engaged with you, but they are also your, your people who go around telling other talents how great you are. So um, think about employee advocacy, not just engagement. Now, we have this thing about training strategy. We always have a training plan. We always have this structure program, etc. But instead of that, think about developing a learning organization, a learning culture, where learning is a way of life. Even as I listen to Doug, I'm learning. Even as I speak to someone, I'm learning. So it's a learning mindset. So we have a saying of anyhow, anywhere, and anytime in SAP. Anytime you talk to someone, you learn. So it's what we call a learning mindset, a learning culture. Of course, harness the power of data and technology that um, Dirk has so kindly shared in the, in the earlier session. Think about how technology and data can help you to make decisions. Really think about business beyond bias that we're talking about and how you can use intelligent HR services to help you in your business and in your HR uh, people strategy. Let's see. Oops, I'm very bad with this mouse. So let me share with you some of the SAP experience, right? We also went through a journey. I uh, joined SAP about 14 and a half years ago. Believe it or not, I chased managers around the desk for their performance appraisal form. They always say it's missing, it's somewhere in line. So it has been a journey that SAP has, and I'm so glad that right now, 80% of our processes are actually in the cloud. I'm able to use my iPad and assess my own learning map, my team's learning map, looking at where my, my analytics are, my turnover, et cetera. So we have done a lot of that. One of the key things we have is really uh, to, to Dirk's question about succession management. We are able to go into the system, I click, 
on one position, I know who are the successors. I double click, I can see the profiles of the successors in terms of their performance rating, their desire, their experience, etc. So this is, everything is online now for us and for HR professionals is a yay, is an advancement, right? It's really helpful. Now the other one is our roadmap. It's not an overnight, it's a journey. So for us as leaders and as HR professional, we just really need to sit down to plan how to do that. Because if you want to plan everything, it's not that easy. But you do it in steps is what will make it more palatable and easier for the change management to happen. So when we did 2012 to 2013, is what we call a talent hybrid. We roll up things like Jam, which is an internal um, Facebook-like kind of thing, where we also have a, a resource where any employee can click and go into there and get information and resources. We update our people profile, etc. And now the last two years, 2014 and 2015, we really look at how to look at the business needs along HR, uh, strategic HR area, workforce planning, learning, recruitment, online recruitment, etc. And of course, we look at how to retrack, uh, manage contingent workforce. It is a growing workforce. And, um, and now we are looking at the new next generation HR practices where I mentioned just now, how do we remove performance rating and encourage that continuous uh, performance-based, dialogue-based performance management. We have alumni relationship right now online where we know where our colleagues are, ex-colleagues are. Of course, predictive analysis, what we did is we actually have this ability to actually run a program and I can predict in a, who are the people, talents, who are highly likely to leave the organization, who have high retention risk, and then proactively as HR and as leaders, we use those data, not that straight away we're going to start doing funny things, but at least to say, understand that particular group of employees, where are they now, what's their retention risk, have that one-on-one -on -one again to understand the career aspirations and work together to make sure that we reduce that retention risk. So the predictive analytics is really critical to us right now. Now, of course, for us in HR, I think you know that um, HR cost is always under pressure. Uh, our resources may not be increasing, but it may be reducing, but the workload, workload nonetheless continue to increase, especially when our organization grow. So we need to really, in order to, we need to be an advocate. We need to be an advocate for cloud, uh, for the organization. So if you look at this ROI for us, we reduce the effort to set employees, uh, I will just highlight a few, yearly objectives. So this is able to, we are able to um, capture updates online uh, quite immediately. We have 66% fewer support tickets for performance review process because of our uh, enhancement in the processes. The key one is we are able to actually click and find out who are the top talents globally for a particular job. So for example, if I have a CEO open in, let's say, Australia, I can go into our talent portal, I can click, I can see who are the ones who aspire to be COOs, I can see who are the ones who are identified as successors, as COO, et cetera. So that one has really, in, in terms of HR, helped us a lot. Not in the past, you start asking people for a resume, hard copy, now everything is online. So for me, I'm super happy about that. Now, of course, we also have a big workforce. We have 80,000, uh, more than 80,000 around the world. So the system has helped us to process more than 12,000 career movements. Can you imagine if we are not having the system, how do we process that high volume? We're able to see who they are, where they are, what they're looking for, et cetera. So that's one big return of investment for us. And of course, the salary planning is really one of my happiest since I uh, joined SAP. In the past, I'm not able to see employees' data in one page. Right now, as a manager, I can plan my employees' bonuses, salary increase, all at the same time, and across multiple countries, in local currency and in euro, for example. So all this is all in one system. My global managers used to complain, oh my God, I have to talk to 20 HR business partners to do salary planning to understand what's the percentage, what is the right way to allocate uh, bonuses, etc. Right now, everything is beautifully in a system. So global managers has given fantastic feedback about that. And data are in there. What is the performance rating? What's the recommended salary range to propose, et cetera? So that one for us is I can actually finish a salary planning in two weeks, bonus allocation in two weeks. 
because the system has enabled us to do that on HR. I don't have to spend three months doing manual analytics. Everything is in the system. So as a HR business partner, um, that has made my life so much better. Now, one of the key things that we did also, like I said, the transparency issues is around the world. So we have also increased, uh, increased transparency. Our, all our salary ranges are open to employees. So they can see the salary ranges, where they are, what grade, etc. So this is a uh, transparency uh, effort that we have done. I think when I joined, I would never say, yeah, oh my God. I would say, no, cannot. Everyone will talk to each other. This is no confidentiality, etc. I think we have moved and understand in the new world, um, transparency is, is there. Whether you like it or not, it's all in the portals, all in the social media. Uh, employees do that. So we do have one globally harmonized uh, system, so it's easy for us and leaders and people manager to consume and uh, to use. So, in summary, uh, the digital era is here to stay. It will disrupt us. It's actually up to us to see how we can really embrace it, change our people strategy, how do we support the business strategy together in partnership with your leaders, um, make it our way of life. Thank you so much again for having me here. Have a good evening. Afternoon. 감사합니다. 제니퍼 부도장님 대단히 감사합니다. 다음은 토론자 우리 박혁철 대표님의 말씀을 듣도록 하겠습니다. 박 대표님은 연세대학교에서 사회학 또 동대학원에서 경영학을 전공하시고 테네시 주립대학에서 마케팅 박사학위를 받으셔서 현재 머서코리아 대표로 계십니다. 박 대표님 추가 설명이나 코멘트 질문 있으면 해주시겠습니까? 네. <웃음> 두분 그 프레젠테이션 감사하고요. 어, 오늘 이 자리에 오신 분들이 관심사 아무래도 그 기술이라는 굉장히 큰 언어인데 그 중에서 HR 애널리티에 관심이 좀 계신 분들이 있을 것 같아서 제가 두 분께 질문 드리기 전에 약간의 좀 코멘트를 해드리겠습니다. 사실은 그 프리딕티브 모델링이나 데이터 애널리시스나 빅데이터 이런 말들이 마케팅이나 서프라이 체인 매니지먼트나 파이낸스에서는 이미 10년 전부터 유행하던 말인데 HR은 굉장히 아직 낯선 단어입니다. 그리고 특히 한국 기업에 굉장히 낯선 단어입니다. 하지만 최근에 이제 글로벌 기업들을 프랙티스를 좀 보면 뭐 여러분 너무 잘 아시는 구글 같은 회사들은 우수한 리더들의 행동을 잘 연구해서 그 행동을 굉장히 행동과 언어를 잘 연구해서 그 행동과 언어에 나온 인사이트를 가지고 리더십 트레이닝을 시켜서 굉장히 효과를 본다든가 아니면 실제 신입사원을 어, 뽑을 때 신입사원이 뽑힌 이후에 2, 3주 동안에 어떤 과제를 내줘야 신입사원이 회사에 잘 적응을 하더라든가 등등 굉장히 많은 분야에 걸쳐 가지고 이 과거의 데이터들을 활용해서 예측을 하는 방식으로 HR 운영하는 것들에서 굉장히 재미를 많이 보고 있습니다. 또 사실은 어떤 거에도 영향이 미치냐면 회사 내 루머가 많습니다. 뭐 좋은 대학 나온 사람이 승진을 빨리 한다더라. 본사에 있는 사람이 승진을 빨리 한다더라. 뭐 남자가 더 이익을 많이 받는다더라. 이런 여러 가지 루머를 수집해서 그 루머가 사실인지 아닌지도 데이터를 가지고 분석해서 회사 내 조직 문화를 빌드업한 그런 사례들도 있고요. 그리고 이제 극단적이긴 한데 회사 내 이메일을 쭉 분석을 해서 이메일이 누구한테 가장 많이 몰려 있는가 업무로드가 그 다음에 누가 이메일을 한참 가지고 있다가 저기 다른 사람한테 답을 제일 늦게 해주는가 또는 받자마자 바로 포워드해 버리는 사람 누군가 뭐 이런 여러 가지 좀 극단적이긴 한데 분석들을 통해서 조직의 생산성을 높이려고 많이들 활용을 하고 있습니다. 근데 이제 한국 기업에서 저희가 쭉 20년 이상 컨설팅을 하면서 이 HR 애널리틱 또는 데이터 분석이 좀 적용이 어려운 이유를 몇 가지 발견했는데 첫째는 아직 여전히 당연히 뭐 중요하긴 하겠지만 HR은 사람에 관한 건데 좀 사람 냄새가 나야 된다. 여기에 무슨 데이터 분석이 들어오고 과학이 들어오고 나아가서 인공지능까지 들어오는 게 맞는 거냐라는 이슈가 있고요. 두 번째는 어, HR에 다루는 정보는 굉장히 퍼스널한 인포메이션인데 한국 기업 특히 한국 기업들은 HR 정보 굉장히 컨피덴셜하고 또 인하우스 그 모든 걸 내부에 두기 원합니다. 하지만 데이터가 잘 분석이 되기 위해서는 어, 굉장히 다양한 그 외부의 벤더들 또는 클라우드 서비스도 써야 되는데 거기에 대해서 아직 굉장히 보수적인 측면이 있고요. 마지막으로 다들 지적하시는 게 데이터 분석을 할 데이터가 틀렸다는 겁니다. 아무리 제도가 있으면 뭐하냐. 그 데이터 다 집어넣은 데이터가 잘못됐다. 이거는 집어넣으시는 분들도 그렇고 경영자들도 생각이 예를 들면 평가 데이터를 못 믿겠다. 그 평가자 몰아준 데이터 아니냐. 이런 생각이 있어서 그 데이터가 잘못됐는데 그 데이터를 어떻게 활용하겠냐는 그런 굉장히 약간 부정적인 시각들이 많습니다. 근데 그럼에도 불구하고 이제 그 마켓 그 HR의 모델이 굉장히 코칭 디벨로프먼트 모델을 바꾸기 때문에 
그 디벨롭먼트를 잘하기 위해서는 명확한 데이터가 필요하고 나아가 개인, 개, 개개인의 데이터도 많이 필요한 실정이고요. 두 번째 굉장히 조직 운영이 컨벌전트하게 하고 되기, 되, 되기 때문에 실제적으로 조직 내부의 데이터 분석을 통해서 업무 배분하는 게 중요해지고 마지막으로 저희가 맨날 이제 그 보통 현업에 계신 분들이 뭘 얘기 많이 하냐면 제도는 훌륭한데 제도는 괜찮은데 운영이 어렵다는 말씀 많이 하십니다. 운영을 잘하기 위해서는 끊임없는 데이터 분석을 통해서 제대로 운영할 수 있는 방법을 찾아야 됩니다. 그렇기 때문에 우리나라 기업도 이제는 더 이상 이 HR 애널리틱이 낯설기보다는 좀 적극적으로 어, 활용을 해야 되는 분야라고 생각하고요. 특히 더크가 얘기했듯이 석세션 플래닝이 데이터 분석과 결합됐을 때 굉장히 파워풀한 효과를 낼수 있는데 한국 기업들은 아직까지도 굉장히 자리를 그 배치할 때 투명성이나 공정성의 그 이슈가 많습니다. 지금 뭐 사회적으로도 투명성, 공정성 얘기가 많지 않습니까? 근데 기업 입장에서 최소한의 디펜스가 될수 있는 방법 중에 하나는 데이터 분석을 통한 석세션 플래닝으로 인사를 진행할 경우에 굉장히 좀 뭐라고 할까요? 객관적이지까지 못하지만 굉장히 투명, 투명성 높은 인사를 관리함으로써 뭐 외압이나 이런 것들도 방지하는 데도 굉장히 효과가 있을 수 있습니다. 그래서 그런 측면에서 HR 애널리틱이 한국 기업에도 굉장히 이제 필요하다 이렇게 어 말씀을 잠깐 드릴 수 있겠고요. I have a question. Dark. I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for sharing your insight with us. Uh, most of all, you know, I discussed about some prejudice and barrier against using, you know, data analytic in HR in Korean company. Uh, based on your experience, could you, you know, provide us some tips how to handle, how to overcome that? Sure. So, every company faces barriers. when they want to start with people analytics. Some barriers are in the area of we don't have data available in one place or we don't trust the data, as you just mentioned. So their people analytics can help to understand the data quality. You mentioned performance reviews. Are these really uh, subjective or objective? Also, people analytics can do there to, to analyze basically the, the distributions to correct for, for example, different cultures. Then there is another question of data privacy, which is uh, very sensitive, obviously. Also in uh, Europe, we have discussions. Uh, we have very strict privacy regulations in France, in Germany. But don't also forget the unions that basically protect the interest of people. So data privacy to me is a fundamental right of a human being. You have the right to be private, you know. To, to have some conflict. But there is also another fundamental right, and it is that you have equal opportunity, no matter if you are a man or woman, if you live in Europe, if you live in Asia. And that is also something that people analysts can really help, because you use data to make objective discussions, and not subjective, as you just gave a few examples. My tips would be, again, to not overhype people analytics. That is the biggest danger for this whole area. Because when you overhype it, the expectations will become so big and you cannot deliver. So make sure, again, with this dual strategy, that you bring data into one place, that you work on definitions, that you work on data quality, that you build internal capabilities to actually work with this data, and then make the use case for the people who actually own the data. And I don't think it's companies, it's you as an employee. You are the owner of your own data. To Let us create an example of how people analysts can help you, and not only the employer. And then you are willing to share your information. Think about Facebook. Everybody puts every, the whole personal life on Facebook. Why? Because it has a benefit. LinkedIn just announced, I think it was this morning, that they have a new service of salary benchmarking. So you provide your own salary into LinkedIn, and LinkedIn can tell you if you are underpaid or overpaid relative to peers in similar functions in similar countries. That's also very sensitive information, but why would you give it? Because it has a service, it gives me insight in how am I compensated compared to my peers. So make the business case and be super transparent. Don't hide anything. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, <laughs> you, you are in the reading HRI's company. a solution company, so you may experience a lot of companies' case. Actually, uh, HR analytics is widely used in many reading companies, but among all those areas in HR, which area is the enjoy the most benefit from the HR analytics 
for example, recruiting or you know performance management? Um, well, I think that the I'm a strong advocate of database, uh, fact-based decision. So for me, every area is important. If you talk to my um, IT colleagues or my HR colleagues at global level, if there is a global call to ask for analytics and to make things uh, transparent, able to give me data, I'm the one. There's no particular area um, that is more important than others, if you ask me. But so far, what I found really, really uh, useful and beneficial is really understanding your workforce in terms of who are the people who are, t uh, who are living, uh, which are your composition, how are the people, which are the group of people that are joining you. I'll give you an example. So right now, for example, we are going to cloud. SAP going to cloud. Our skills and things need to change. So what I needed from, from, um, to help me to move forward with the organization, to hire the right talents with the right skills in a going forward manner, I need data. I need to know who are our top performers. How are they performing? What are they doing different to be uh, top performers? What's the difference between what I call a cloud talent versus what we call a comprem talents? So all these are very important to me. Once I get those data, I'm able to create success profiles, first of all, for hiring. I'm able to use the profile to help employees who need development to be successful. And I'm also using that profile to create something where the employee can use to move forward in their career. So for me, it uh, depends on how and what you want, what are the key things that are important to you, prioritize. If as HR, we go to your, your CEO and say, I need you give me $2 million to have the full suite, you know we won't get it. But if you can put up a business case, ROI, what kind of returns they will get, you get better, the better talents, you get more productivity out of your current talents, you will increase your retention. Which CEO will not want to hear this as an ROI of the investment? So I hope I answer your question. Thanks. 예, 감사합니다. 제가 지금 어, 정중 쪽에서 주신 몇 가지 질문을 갖고 있는데 시간이 되는 대로 하나하나 하나 하겠습니다. 먼저 덕크 정커 대표님께 여쭤봅니다. 피플 어널리틱스에 관련하여 일반적으로 퇴사율, 평균 연령, 성별 구성 등을 사용하고 있습니다. 이 데이터를 의사 결정에 더잘 사용하기 위해서 기존에 많이 사용했던 분석 자료와 더불어 추가로 사용할 수 있는 분석 자료의 예를 몇 가지 더 설명해 주실 수 있을까요? 오케이, okay, so this also comes back a bit to the to the previous question, Mr. Andy Park. It's all about the context. So again, we don't do people analytics just because people analytics. We don't use artificial intelligence in HR because it is cool to use. So find very particular topics. So examples could be for companies that are struggling with getting enough people on board. You could have people analytics examples in recruiting. How can we, so we work with a, a German company right now and they have a question on how to search for the best sales consultants in the market. They get so many, so many people uh, applying for res uh, with resumes, and it costs so much time to to slice and dice all the information, to trial people in jobs, etc. So what we did there was we first defined what makes a sales consultant a good sales consultant. What what is good? Is it somebody that makes a lot of money, that brings it a lot of profit, that grows a team, that grows profit, etc. Based on that, you can use cluster analysis to find. What do these people have in common in terms of characteristics? So this goes back to clustering. And then scouting for people with those same clusters, those same combination of attributes, helps, helps recruiting departments to source more effectively. Also, you can use sourcing channels, for example, to see which sourcing channel is more effective than the other. Do we go to universities or do we do a job post on LinkedIn? Um, so th that is a completely different example in uh, in recruiting space. Uh, not a quick example of um, employee turnover is to see why are people leaving the company. Typically, what companies do is they would look at the first, you know, if there's turnover in the first six months, so people leave already within the six months, then probably the match was not so good between the person and the company. They had different expectations. If the person is leaving between six months and one year then you could question the onboarding program. If people are leaving after one year, 
then maybe there is something else going on. So in many different areas, and please connect me on LinkedIn because I can share a lot of information. Um, every different area has very specific analytics possible. Thank you. The next question is to Jennifer. In Singapore, as far as I know, job seeking is shifting from domestic jobs into overseas jobs for the high level professionals, especially on medical and health sector. And so what is the trend of job seeking for the medical fields in Singapore and influx and outflux of workers in medical steps? Any idea about medical area? Hear most of the question. Is it in English or in Korean? The question. It's in English. That's why I read it. Okay. 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 Um, I'm afraid I I may not be able to answer that that question with real facts. Um, for us in Singapore, I think if I can para, uh, can clarify the question, they're asking about the medical field. Am I right to say the inflow and outflow? Yeah. So I wonder which is the doctor in the house is asking that question. But uh, basically, pharmaceutical is a, a strong industry for us. I think right now, we are medically very strong. I think there are more influx of talents into Singapore than outflux, to be very honest. I, I think you know that we have done some miracle operations that none has done in the world, but SAP, uh, SAP. <laughs> Singapore has done it. So I, I don't know whether I'm answering the question, but basically, I think the talents are, are more in inwards towards Singapore medical field. If I may read, if I could see that question, if I may. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't hear it very well because of the mic as well. Okay. Then in the meantime, I can make another question to Doug. How much do you rely on the assessment test as more corporations are using them in their hiring process when it comes to people analytics? So to be completely honest with you, we just started with assessments, assessment data. Why did we just start? Because not many companies have this very structuredly available. So we all started with what data do companies have available. But there is a lot of hidden information in assessment tests. Imagine that you link assessment tests to the employee performance. Or imagine that you link engagement surveys to employee turnover, to really understand why are people leaving the company instead of just looking at exit interviews. So as this field is growing, we need to add more sources of data to this, to this data lake, if you want to call it that way. And assessment data is very important because this is typically not stored in an HR system. Mm -hmm. Did you read the Yeah, yeah. Question? All right, I got, got the question now. So like, um, basically, uh, this colleague was in the room. Um, they are, like I said, even for the medical field, the labor mobility is high, in and out. I think right now, there's no boundary between any countries at all. The only thing that's stopping people from moving is actually that certificate, whether it's valid or not, in the different countries. So we do have a lot of, if you like, nurses, um, outbound, inbound into Singapore because we don't have enough. We also have doctors who want to specialize coming to Singapore. But we also have people who want a better lifestyle. You may know that I, my, my admiration for the Korean colleagues here who are very hardworking. You guys are too hardworking, by the way. But Singapore has a very bad work-life balance as well. So a lot of them do not have the work-life balance they want. So what do they do? Those who don't like the, that lifestyle, they move out. So it depends on what they are looking for, if they wanted to have really advanced knowledge, advanced technology, um, great ability to learn new things, they come to Singapore. And the ability to contribute, of course. But if they want a better lifestyle, they want to have a more freedom, etc., um, they can go home at five. Uh, most of those people actually has migrated out of Singapore. So I hope that answered the question from the colleague uh, on this. Okay, the next question to, again, Jennifer. And uh, in your slide, uh, in, you said, next generation change jobs in every two years. And if so, then how can a corporate sustain the cost company royalty? Very, very good question. 
because really uh, this the cost of hiring and turnover we all know is very high it's two to three times the OTE of a turnover for the, for the millennials really understanding what they are what they are like what they they want to do this continuous conversation of for them is important so as managers as leaders it's really engaging with them what I would recommend to be honest is this get your millennials in in focus groups get them to talk to you they said looking at the current current situation what do you like about the company what do you wish that the company can do what can we do to support you to grow within an organization these are the things where they like they miss you care about me as a person you care to ask me to give you feedback. You care to give me input. And together, they are very, very willing to work with you, to work on a program, etc. So that way, you retain your talents and also hear from them. Of course, uh, they may be itchy after two years, right? After two years, I want to do something new. That's what they are like. Think about where you can move them. After two years in a certain job, hey, move them to another part of your organization. They are very quick learners. And they are very keen to learn. And you'll be amazed how smart they are. I am a Generation X person. I have a reverse mentoring. That means instead of me as a earlier talent in the organization, that I mentor the young, I do the reverse. I have a young talent who mentor me to tell me about how do I tweet, which I don't like, how do I get to social media, how do I do a better LinkedIn, etc. So give them that ability to feedback to you and also share their thinking with you. That way they feel that, hey, I have a future with you, you enjoy me as your talent, and I'm also able to share with you what things are like and learn from you. So coaching, mentoring, continuous feedback, get their input, get them together to give you ideas. That's how you can actually create the environment that they will strive in. 예, 감사합니다. 지금 제가 몇 장의 질문을 더 갖고 있는데 시간 관계상 다 소화하지 못해 죄송합니다. 궁금하신 거는 직접 연사분들께 물음을 질문해 주시면 대단히 감사하겠습니다. 끝나고 나서 이 자리에 잠깐 오셔서 질문해 주셔도 좋을 것 같습니다. 이제 시간이 많이 지나서 이 세션을 정리하고자 합니다. 급변하는 기업 환경에서 우리 HR 역할과 새로운 기법들에 대해 중요한 인사이트를 얻으셨으리라 생각합니다. 경청해 주시고 끝까지 동참해 주신 적극적으로 협조해 주신 여러분께 감사드립니다. 오늘 우리에게 또한 귀한 말씀을 해주신 덕후 존커, 제니퍼, 박형철 대표님께 큰 박수를 부탁드립니다. 감사합니다.